All right, what a group. So class, this is great, this is great. Uh, welcome everyone, welcome so much. I am Tim Elliott with Elliott Sidewalk Communities. We are here today to kind of talk a little bit about the economic impact of what this great project that the collaboration of ECU, us and the city looks like. Uh, before I do, I want to take a, take a little bit of time and recognize some folks. First and foremost, my great business partner, Brian Rogers, up front here. Um, those who know us, we are literally lifelong friends and had the great joy of working on a project like this together. We built tree forts as kids. We're building bigger tree forts now. Um, I also want to uh, recognize a few people here also. Uh, and please, as always, forgive me. This is a great group, so I'm sure I'm leaving someone out. But uh, Tom Kolakowski from North Carolina Eastern Alliance, Bill Moore, who's with Congressman Murphy's office, Trey Lewis with Senator Tillis's office, Councilman Rick Smiley is here with us today, Gloristeen Brown, Mayor of Bethel, Alan Thomas with the Small Business Administration, of course, Scott Shook, Chair of ECU Board, Tony Cannon with Greenville Utilities, Ann Wall here, City Manager, many from their, her, her office, Dr. Lawrence Rouse with Pitt Community College. Betty Jo Shepard with Senator Burr's office. We can go on. And Ricky Hines, Mayor of Winterville. Welcome all and everyone. So I appreciate everyone's great attention. Um, today, I'm going to start this off with a really quick chat. And I want to introduce the great speakers, because you're not here to see me. Better talent ahead. I want to talk about why we're here. And I'm just going to bring up two words. Strangely enough, tides and trains crazy way to start it. I always view what Brian's and my work is, is really economic impact. And I think about, I've been here since 2015, working on some projects right on Dickinson, helping that community along and then rolling right into this large, great project. Um, and I talk about tides only because as I see, it happens so slowly, the economic tide. It ebbs and flows, we don't see it. But economic engines win, and economic engines fail. And so what we're talking about today is, and it's hard for cities sometimes when an economic engine goes away, and we don't have to talk about it, but we know on the great shoulders of tobacco this town was born, but so much has happened in the past few decades to kind of shed that economy, move toward a new world, and a tide is not waning, a tide is now coming in. We have incredible momentum happening now. We have the great happenings over at ECU Health. Dr. Waldron will talk about that. We have this economic project that Brian and I are working on now. Uh, between the two of us, that's half a billion dollars coming to town within a half mile of each other. There are more great developers and projects in this room today that are also adding to the tide. So know that, that we're here to talk about what this tide means and how it looks like coming in. And it's a big one. And Dr. Anaban Bursu, who's one of the world-class economists and I assure you, you will not be lulled to sleep by graphs and charts. You will be excited from one of the great, great speakers. I've had the great pleasure of seeing him, and he's put together a great study he'll share with you later. And lastly, about trains. Um, yes, this is a train town, but that's not why I'm talking about train. I just, I've always seen Greenville as the capital of Eastern North Carolina. And the economic momentum that we're talking about today helps us catch that economic train that North Carolina is riding right now, the great train that is moving this state forward. We want to assure with this project that we take all of the projects collectively here and enjoying the capital of Eastern North Carolina with that economic train that they always hear in the press from Charlotte to Raleigh. And so we need to join that train or, or not. And so we're here to absolutely join that train. So I just wanted to say that uh, ahead today, we're going to uh, have some great folks, Dr. Michael Van Scott from ECU, who's the uh, Vice Chancellor for Research, Economic Development Engagement, is going to chat a little bit what's happening with ECU in that front. Uh, Sarah Bernhardt's here with us today from the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. We have Dr. Michael Waldrum talking about the great institution of what is the seventh largest hospital in the nation here in our town and what's happening there. So we look forward to that. And then right after that, we'll hear about the project and Dr. Anaban Basu. And so with that, I'd like to bring up Dr. Michael Van Scott to kind of lead us off and tell us the great happenings of the economic research and, and, and what's happening with the ECU and, and, and his jobs bringing the town. Thank you.
Good morning. This is, a, uh, this is an intimidating group. You know, as I, as I look out here, there are people with more history at ECU than I have, and I've been here since 1990. There are people who know different parts of this university much better than I do. So I think part of my job here today is level setting. In order to be successful in a project like this, we've all got to be on the same page. We've got to be moving forward in the same direction, pulling together, right? So that's what I'm going to try to do today, is just give you an idea of where ECU is. Your memories from years ago may be a little different than where we really are today. So real short, let's get started. So it's, it's spring break, right? Pretty quiet around town right now. But I can guarantee you that the university is not quiet. We have things going from coast to coast. Out at CSI right now, they're planning for the Waves to Water competition. This is a program that is a competition that's funded by the Department of Energy for teams to come in from around the country and to test their ideas on how to convert wave energy into clean water. Take the energy from the waves, desalinate the salt water, right, and produce clean water. $3.5 million prize, right? That's going to happen out there. They're preparing for it. It'll happen in April. Uh, you know, we've got our College of Education is working with principals across the country on developing best practices for public education, and that continues to drive forward. That's funded by a $10 million grant from the, from the Department of Education. I'm going to leave the, the medical school and, and progress there to Dr. Waldrum. You know, our North Carolina Agri-Medicine Institute continues to work with our, forest, our foresters, our loggers, our fishers, um, farmers on their health and safety. Those things continue to go on. Not all of our students are down in Florida on the beach. You know, some of them are out working, stabilizing the shorelines, doing environmental work. Others are, you know, providing food security for disadvantaged populations across the, the east. In the last two days, we've had a bus full of faculty and students, staff, that have been touring the region. And they've been talking with business partners, with community leaders, about their challenges and the opportunities for us to participate in those solutions. You know, they bring those ideas back and they socialize them and we prioritize them. And those ones that, that look like they really could make a difference, we put implementation teams around. That might happen through the RISE 29 program. Funded by Golden Leaf, it provides money to put interns out into those businesses, into those communities, to work on those solutions. Might be through the Accelerate Rural program run by Dennis Trox over in the, uh, the Miller School of Entrepreneurship. Dennis links mentors from across the country with rural business leaders. Those mentors, mentors are experts in digital marketing. And they provide guidance, advice on how those rural businesses can really increase their digital presence and expand their market base. So we've spent a lot of time developing the infrastructure for this type of support for the region. We've got ideation spaces where you can come in and assemble a team and really think through that idea and refine it. We've got design facilities where you can really work on the solution and what it looks like. If you need a prototype, we've got maker spaces to provide that. If you need some light manufacturing for proof of concept, we've got those facilities available. Right? We've got incubator space. If a company needs some inexpensive space until they get a revenue stream, you know, we've got that for them. And then throughout this entire process, we've got business consultants who are there every step of the way to ensure that whatever comes out maximizes the potential for revenue, for business success. So here's another example of how this works. Many of you will recognize this building from your past. A few years ago, ECU worked with community leaders to negotiate to buy this building. We renovated it into office space. Some of you have been through it. Currently, the, uh, the ECU research offices 
and the Industry Relation Office sit in that building. The Greenville ENC Alliance is in the back of the building. The North Carolina East Alliance is downstairs in the building. Mark Phillips from the Biotechnology Center is with us in that building. And Kelly Andrews is just around the corner. The synergy in that group drives change. So it's informing our continuing and professional education program. Sharon Painter is actively changing that program and focusing it on micro-credentials and badging so that workers can develop those competencies that they need in a short period of time, get the job they want or stay in the job that they want while they're progressing in their education. Right? And that's being informed by that group and by the industries around us. <clears throat> when we started to think about the, the workforce issues for the pharma industry, right, we brought together the economic developers, the industry partners, the, the leadership from the public school systems, community college partners, right, and we really thought about what needed to happen to solve and address that workforce shortage that we have. That led to the application to the Golden Leaf Foundation to create the Eastern Region Pharma Center, which you're gonna have an opportunity to, to tour here uh, this morning. That concept has been expanded, and we've, we're part of a, about a $60 million statewide proposal to the uh, Economic Development Administration for workforce development. And about $6 million of that proposal would, would come out here to uh, strengthen our workforce development initiatives. So affordable housing is one of the things that uh, we've been focused on. And uh, again, Sharon Painter and her group have been, been uh, really instrumental in this. They got 44 local governments to come together and really talk about affordable housing. We couldn't even agree on a definition of affordable housing when we started. They not only agreed on the definition, they came together, formed a consortium that allows them to request and obtain money through housing and urban, urban development, right? So they could get $600,000, $700,000 a year in recurring funding to support affordable housing for the workforce in the region. You know, these are the sorts of things you can do when you're pulling together when you develop those synergies. Right? Another example is the Naval Tech Bridge. Keith Wheeler worked with uh, the FRC East leadership and uh, the economic development uh, leaders. And on a mechanism by which the FRC East organization could basically develop innovative solutions rapidly to their issues that they have in their enterprise. So what it does is allow them to put out calls for ideas on how they can address the solution. That can lead to private companies putting in proposals, rapidly getting contracts to investigate those proposals, those ideas, and move those solutions forward. Right? Good for the companies, facilitates contracting, Good for DOD, they get their solutions. Right? We've become pretty good at this. If you look at the number of proposals, the amount of proposals going in from ECU in 2015, we put in about $200 million a year. This last year, that was over $300 million a year. In 2015, about 17% of those proposals were funded. We were running about $35 million a year in grants and contracts. And these are coming in from outside the region, folks. This is new money coming into the region. Last year, that was $75 million. But the striking thing to me is that 52% of that funding came in for non-research projects, exactly the types of things we're talking about. Outreach, education, training, workforce development, right? Healthcare, 52%. That's unusual for a university, but I think it's a reflection of what this university values and how strongly we believe in the mission of serving the region. 
in our communities. So we've got a lot of resources available to us at the university. Um, and partners that settle here at Intersect East are going to be able to access those resources. Right? You know, we have to have a lot of capacity in order to su sustain our teaching mission, right? But it's not utilized all the time. It's not maximally utilized. We can make better use of it by sharing it with the industries that locate here and partner with us. And we're, we've developed a mechanism by which that can happen, right? You can collaborate directly with faculty and access their laboratories through shared projects, right? You can put master service agreements in place so that we've got everything worked out ahead of time. If you want to do some work, you can put in a work order in 24 hours, we can start working on that for you. You can do fee for service in any of our core facilities. Walk in, say what you want. We got the price, here it is. We do the work. Visiting scientist scholar agreements, you know, if you have somebody coming in that really wants to spend time on the campus, in the labs with independence, we can set up a separate agreement for them to come in and do that. So we've got the mechanisms in place to support the industries coming in here on this campus. So what I see the advantage of this really initiative is, is that it provides adjacency for the industry with the university, for the university with the industry. We share resources, they inform our programming, so we're developing a better, developing a better product for them, right? And they have access to our expertise and our capacity through faculty, staff, and facilities. With that, I'm gonna turn the podium over to Sarah Bernhardt uh, of the Economic Development Partnership. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and greetings from the EDPNC CEO, Chris Chung, and our Vice President of Global Business Services, John Loyak, who are sorry that they couldn't be here on this exciting day. So I apologize, but you're stuck with the C team today. Seriously, all of us at the EDPNC are very excited about this transformative project for the Uptown District, Greenville, Pitt County, and the region. Today I want to briefly highlight how the EDPNC stands ready to support this project now and over the next decade. First, when companies are looking to locate at Intersect East from outside the state or outside the country, the EDPNC's business recruitment team will be there to help guide the company's decision making and garner discretionary financial incentives and, excuse me, and from the state and its local partners, as well as, as customized training incentives from Pitt Community College. When small businesses, the innovators, and the startups at Intersect East need assistance with questions regarding their legal structure, licenses and permits, tax information, or employer requirements. Our small business advisors will be answering the phones in Raleigh and getting those questions answered. When companies at Intersect East need help with exporting and growing their global markets, our International Trade Division will be ready to assist with advice, information, and grant opportunities for marketing. When the manufacturers and tech companies of Intersect East are ready to grow by adding employees and increasing capital investment, I, as the existing industry expansions manager for the Northeast Prosperity Zone, will help them access financial and training incentives from the state and local governments and the community college. And finally, our tourism division, which manages the Visit NC brand, will be eager to promote the restaurants, recreational amenities, and entertainment options at Intersect East. 
Yet the EDPNC won't do all of this work on our own. We expect to collaborate heavily with our many current partners, ECU, Electra Cities, the Greenville ENC Alliance, Greenville Utilities, NC East Alliance, the North Carolina Biotech Center, the North Carolina Department of Commerce, Pitt County Economic Development, the Community College, and Uptown Greenville. We all know that Down East has lagged in its economic development compared to the state's more prosperous regions to the West. As Tim alluded to, this area may have been slower to transition its economy from textiles and tobacco. But we all know what a rising tide does. Intersect East will help to elevate the rural areas within Pitt County and the surrounding counties. The EDPNC is committed to adding, to aiding in this exciting transformation. And now I'd like to invite the CEO of ECU Health and Dean of the Brody School of Medicine, Dr. Michael Waldrum, to come up. Thank you, Sarah. This is, as Mike said, this is really a scary, scary group to present to for me because all my bosses are in this room. <laughs> And I'm not going to have a show of hands, but I, I, I love the fact that we are here on this corner to have this discussion and to really look into the future because um, I think it's emblematic of what I love so much about the East, about the community and about people coming together to solve really hard problems. Um, and that we can look to the future um, and see this incredible potential in front of us and build it together. Um, so it's really exciting and intimidating uh, to be here um, as the Dean of the Brody School of Medicine and as the CEO of ECU Health. And um, we're looking at transforming healthcare and healthcare education as we come out of the pandemic and we look at that future it's about innovation. It's about rethinking the future and driving value for our communities and how we serve our communities and, and meet the challenges that we have, um, which are really opportunities for us. ECU is the largest producer of healthcare professionals of any university in the state of North Carolina. Talk about a foundation to build on. ECU Brody School of Medicine is the highest value school of medicine in the country. Talk about a foundation to build and a future with, a bright future. And that happened, both of those examples happened by a lot of leaders in this room and about innovating and about actually um, working in an environment that may have scarcity of resource which drives innovation. And it's really something that this community and university should be proud of and North Carolina should be proud of. The School of Medicine is such a, a special place and I'm so honored to be the dean uh, now for about eight months. Um, and um, it's really a school built by North Carolinians for North Carolinians. And a lot of people don't understand that. The only, the only students we accept at Brody are kids from North Carolina. They have a deep, deep commitment to our communities and um, to our rural communities. So just a really, really special um, group of professionals and up, up and coming leaders. And I wrote an email to uh, a group yesterday that says, let's just get a bunch of students in there and set them free. They'll make us innovate. They're really bright and really great people. They're unbelievable. I'd have never gotten in medical school if I had to compete with these kids. It's really unbelievable. And then as CEO of Viden Health, which is now ECU Health, um, we are the leading provider of healthcare in Eastern North Carolina. The toughest healthcare market in the United States. We've got massive issues. We've heard about being left behind, but it's been an underserved market for, for generations. And the pandemic has, has 
really stressed health care. But if you think about what that offers us as a nine hospital system with over 100 practice sites that are integrated and working now as one coordinated group of assets and team members to transform health care embedded in our communities with intimate relationships to understand community needs and transform and build solutions and innovate at the community level that helps bring our communities forward. That's the work we're doing. We have 1.4 million people in Eastern North Carolina that we serve with those nine hospitals. And as has been mentioned, in Greenville's, a lot of people don't know this, we have one of the, the country's largest hospitals. Exact number, um, it's hard to sometimes calculate, but it's clearly in the top 10 largest hospitals in the country. It's a massive ship that provides unbelievable service all the time, 24-7, 365, and I'm honored to represent the team members that, that do that work that are over 13,000 strong, over 1,500 physicians that serve our communities and work in teams and um, serve every day to make that $4 billion economic, yearly economic impact happen um, and every day, and it continues to grow. So it's really, um, we heard a little bit about the importance of these assets, the university assets um, that Mike uh, highlighted. Um, but as we build ECU Health, we have this whole other set of assets that we are able to bring online. And excited about in that we're working really hard in that we're building a new medical school. So there's teams working. Uh, we're so thankful to our legislators um, and the support that we've been given at Brody to conceptualize the future of healthcare education, build the most state-of-the-art facility at Brody to educate the future healthcare workers and, and enjoy the innovation that we will um, have them be involved with. We're doing that today and we view the new building as an opportunity to accelerate that work. We're planning on cutting a ribbon within four years, so it's an aggressive project and we're so excited about uh, the work to do that um, as we tr transform and build ECU Health to create a regional rural population health company organization that improves the health and well-being of Eastern North Carolina. And I feel, you know, that I know so many people in here but, and that know me and know what I believe about how do we improve the health and well-being of Eastern North Carolina. But we do that with intention around economic development. So we serve and are active and support all of those economic development activities that we've heard about that we do it by promoting education across the spectrum of education. And then we provide excellent high value, so lower cost, higher quality healthcare for the people we serve. That's what we aim to do and that's what we do. Um, and we're so excited about doing that um, with this future and the par partnerships that uh, in Intersect East will bring. Because in order to do that, really, it takes innovation and collaboration. Uh, and uh, clearly, innovation will be part of um, how we transform healthcare in the United States. And it's a huge opportunity to develop technologies we haven't even conceived of yet to do, th to do that work. And um, we already have some some lines in the water, so to speak, and some ideas um, and potential occupants that is just the tip of the iceberg on really bringing groups together to innovate and find solutions on how we drive value in healthcare. Healthcare is, as we all know, one of the largest vertical industries in our nation, and it's time for us to use our assets in healthcare to bring economic opportunity to Eastern North Carolina, not just in the service provision and the education, but in technology development. Um, and so we're so excited about Intersect East and the potential that brings. And I have no doubt that as we evolve and transform, 
um, the business opportunities will be significant for Greenville and Eastern North Carolina and the communities that Vidant and ECU Health serves. Intersect East is the intersection across the East to bring people together to do that work. But it's also the intersection between, as we sit on this corner, between the East and West Campus. And as the leader of ECU Health, I'm working very hard with the Chancellor to make sure that we understand all of the assets across the university. And Mike mentioned those, and I really appreciate that, Mike. That, that there's been division within the university and, and, and lack of collaboration across the university to understand fully the breadth of the assets which are enormous on the East Campus that can be utilized in the West Campus, the Health Sciences, to advance our objectives. And it's time that we live to the strategies of ECU and be one ECU to drive regional transformation and to drive student success by teaching them how to innovate. So I'm really excited about this. It's such a great ce celebration. And with, a, with that, I'm gonna introduce Tim Elliott, who's gonna come and say, uh, or Tim, come on back up. And thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, we're here now to kind of see how that intersection really looks like from an economic impact. I have the great pride and pleasure to welcome Dr. Anirban Basu, who will kind of enlighten us on what does it mean, all these construction jobs, all these research biotech jobs, and how does it impact the community? So with that, Dr. Basu. Right, but the first question is why is the, uh, why is this picture not uh, showing up, right? Okay, so is that up? No, it's still not. Oh, there it is. Oh, thank goodness. Now, that's my two daughters right there, right? Oh, yeah, I know. Um, I know. All right. Oh, that's the right presentation. And there it is. All right, great. That's the hardest part, actually, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah my name is Ani Ban Basu. I'm an economist. Please hold any further applause. And they've asked me to uh, talk about uh, the economic implications of this development, what it means for Greenville, North Carolina, and Pitt County, and Eastern Carolina generally. It's a privilege to be with you this morning. I want to try to put some more detail and statistics around what's already been said. This is, of course, about innovation. It's about taking or helping to take Greenville into its future. It's about a future associated with broadly shared prosperity, obviously. And you know, Tim made the point about uh, you know, currents changing, the economy changing, industries growing and then shrinking. And so at some point, uh, tobacco was important. At some point, uh, caulking uh, British ships with, uh, with tar was important, hence the name of the Tar River, all of those things. But not many British ships are, are caught that way anymore. Not much tobacco is grown anymore. And so one has to leap forward into the future. And how fortunate is the community to be home to East Carolina University to help usher it forth into that future. But of course, what needs to happen is a synergy between that university and the balance of the community. It's good for the university. It's good for the community. And that's what Intersect East is all about. And so let's talk about the economic and fiscal impacts of this, uh, shall we? So first, uh, a little bit about uh, us. And my slide has changed here somewhat. So I'm going to try to change it back on the fly. This is very, no, I'm not going to do that. So well, my company is name is Sage Policy Group, Inc. We have clients uh, in virtually every state. For some reason, we don't have clients in Arkansas and Maine. We're working on it. Uh, we've had clients in Cambodia, Indonesia, in fact, have maintained an office in Indonesia for quite some time. Uh, the Bahamas, which is uh, I, I, very enjoyable, uh, as it turns out, to visit those clients, and I uh, often ask to visit them. Um, and so, you know, we do a lot of work for uh, not just developers, of course, but also for medical systems. Uh, I do a fair amount of litigation support, so I'm in court testifying a lot about uh, various things. Uh, my name is Ani Ban Basu. Uh, we have, you know, we did the economic impact study uh, for a, an NFL team recently, as it turns out, their impact on the community. I'm not allowed to say who it was, but they also uh, wear purple, uh, as it turns out. So that's all I can say. So that boils it down to two, basically. Um, and so, and also, this final bullet here is important. One of the things I'm going to do for you is I'm going to show you the, the output 
of our implant model. Implant uh, is uh, a, a input output econometric software. You pump in project details, you get output with respect to the economic and fiscal implications of the project. And so we use this implant modeling software. It comes out of the Minnesota Implant Group. The University of Minnesota, for many, many years, has had a spectacular statistics department, econometrics department. Uh, and they specialize in simulating the economy. So they turn the economy into equations, basically, and then they shock the economy. Some, some stimulus, some uh, impetus uh, to change the economy, and then what is the effect of that stimulus on the economy. And so that's, that's what, and, and you know, you can use or, or poorly use, or use well or poorly use a model. And Implant views this as a group of people who use that software effectively, the way it's supposed to be used. And in fact, as I say, uh, we have been used as a case study for how that, that, that uh, Implant modeling software should be utilized. So what is the nature of this endeavor? Elliott Sidewalk Communities commissioned us, my company, Sage Policy Group, to estimate the economic and fiscal benefits associated with uh, Intersect East development, obviously here in Greenville, North Carolina. It's a mixed-use project uh, that will offer nearly a million square feet of research less office, light industrial, retail, and residential space, and serve as a bridge between East Carolina University and the Dickinson Avenue Arts District. Okay, but. So it's a, it's a mixed-use development, fine. And you can model it as a mixed-use development, and we have to a certain extent. But what's really the proper perspective here? What is this really? And what we concluded is that what this really is, the economics of this really fits um, a research park. And that's because of East Carolina University and the link to East Carolina University. Uh, I think the statistics have already been presented. Uh, this is straight from the... A university's website, by the way, these data. So if the website is wrong, then we're wrong. But uh, the fourth largest university in North Carolina, only university in the state with a dental school, medical school, and college of engineering at the same institution. Well, that's really quite remarkable. Because so much of the innovation these days takes place in engineering uh, and in medicine. I mean, how many diseases are there yet to conquer? Um, how, you know, how much transportation is there out there to improve? And so, how much robotics is there to develop? All these kinds of things. Uh, and so, again, this very much shapes how we viewed this development. This is more than just a simple mixed-use project. Approximately 22,000 undergraduate students, 5,600 graduate professional students, and more than 2,000 faculty. Now, one of the things that, you know, in estimating this analysis, you sort of take this development, Intersect East, and you're infusing this into the local economy as it is. But my estimates could be wildly understated ultimately. Why is that? Because all it takes is one company that really becomes quite grand. Some startup, those so-called unicorns, those companies that become a billion dollars very, very quickly in terms of their market capitalization, all it takes is one company. I, I can't speculate on that. I, I can't speculate on the notion that this will create the next uh, Intel or Sun Microsystems or Biogen or Moderna or Pfizer or Merck. I don't know that. But all it would take would be one of those and then you have outsized economic impacts far beyond what my modeling can possibly anticipate. The Brody School of Medicine and Vidant Health, with more than 13,000 employees and nine hospitals that just been mentioned, just announced ECU Health, a joint operating uh, agreement. And as I say, there's so much innovation that is there to take place in medicine. I mean, have we cured diabetes? I don't think so. Have we cured cancer? Not yet. Um, have we uh, uh, cured heart disease? Not, not at all. Um, are we still trying to refine uh, organ transplantation? We are. All of those things. And all of a sudden, this development creates the opportunity that some of those innovations, or more of those innovations, would like to take place here. Some of that's already occurring, of course. We heard that. But there's more, because there's synergies with a broader community. Uh, this Greenville, North Carolina, uh, as, as Tim rightly said, the, the economic capital of Eastern Carolina, Eastern North Carolina. Survey of, uh, so again, we viewed this as a research park. And you might say, well, yeah, but there's, you know, residential and there's some retail. So it's not just a pure research park. Yeah, that's, that's what makes it better. It's not just about researchers being locked into laboratory space trying to come up with the next innovation. It's about them actually integrated in the community, maybe even living in the community. So a survey of 108 North American university research uh, parks found that research parks are rapidly transitioning to live, work, play. It's not about isolating scientists and laboratories. It's forcing them to be a bit extroverted. But of course, for them to innovate, to commercialize, they need to be extroverted because they need to meet with bankers and lawyers and maybe even venture capitalists at some point. 
Um, research parks are rapidly transitioning to live, work, play. Nearly one in five with uh, primarily commercial real estate environments were planning to transition to live, work, play environments within the next five years. Well, that's already happening here with Intersect East. It's already planned to be that. Research parks excel and expand with 74% of respondents having opened a new building within the previous five years. They're also extraordinarily resilient. Uh, you know, we just came through a recession in 2020. Um, research parks, because technology continues to move forward, even during the worst of economic times, and I'll at least some time at the end of this for Q&A, so if you want to ask me why oil is trading at $117 a barrel today in North America, or why Bitcoin is up $4,000 this morning, we can talk about that. Um, but, uh, but the point is, the economy is good sometimes, and not so good uh, sometimes, but research parks tend to move forward during the worst of economic times. So for instance, 64% of responding parks added employment from 2007 to 2012, which was, as it turns out, a period that embodied the Great Recession. The most important key attribute of a research park was a good match between core competency of the affiliated university and the recruited tenants. And when you hear Tim Elliott and others talk about this project, that's what they talk about. Alignment between what the university is great at doing and will be great at doing and the tenants at this park. So let's talk more about the critical importance of research parks. They are seen increasingly around the world to create dynamic clusters that accelerate economic growth and international competitiveness. So I don't know if you're tired of hearing about all the great economic successes in Charlotte, North Carolina. Perhaps you're a bit exhausted by hearing about all the economic successes in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. It would be nice for the folks in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina to have to read about your successes. And that's ultimately what this is uh, about. They are widely considered to be a pr uh, proven mechanism or tool to encourage the formation of innovative high technology companies. They're also seen as an effective means to generate employment and to make companies more competitive. But I would also say that beyond all that, it's very good for the university. Why? Well, university is competing for human capital, for talent for the best students, the brightest kids. And when those kids come for, for their visit to East Carolina University, obviously it's a beautiful campus. Obviously there's been a lot of progress. Obviously there's a lot of young people milling about. That's attractive in and of itself. But to be able to show them that it's a community that supports the university, uh, and a university that supports the community, all to the good. Um, and so that's what this is about. It's an intersection. It's, it's about whatever the cleavages have been historically, getting rid of those and intersecting, coming together, synergizing, working together. Some more on this. Once an industrial commons has taken root in a region, a powerful virtuous cycle feeds its growth. Experts flock there because that's where the jobs and knowledge networks are. Firms do the same to tap the talent pool, stay abreast of advances, and be near suppliers and potential partners. And what is the economy about today? It's about, as I say, this competition for human capital. In December of, the, of last year, America was home to 10.9 million available unfilled jobs. We only had 58 unemployed Americans for every 100 job openings. It's one of the reasons wages are growing so rapidly. Human capital is in high demand. Of all types, by the way, it, whether it's in restaurants or hotels or in accountancies or law firms or engineering companies or in biotech or among civil engineers. So what makes for a successful community? The community that can keep the best and the brightest at home. And my guess is one of the things that folks in Greenville would like is that when they produce in their families really, really smart kids, and those really, really smart kids, let's say, go to East Carolina University, which uh, will play Cincinnati tomorrow, as it turns out, uh, in the tournament, the men's team. So that, I'll be watching for that. Um, they, after they graduate, they want those kids to be able to stay here. Not to have to go to Raleigh or Charlotte or Washington, D.C. or Atlanta, heaven forbid. Uh, you know, my goodness. So this would provide that kind of opportunity, that catchment mechanism. Now let me talk about the actual statistical economic impacts. So some methodological notes. Sorry about this. I have to get into the rigor of this. Uh, we used, as I say, in-plan modeling software. It's an industry standard input-output estimation platform to generate economic and fiscal impact estimates. And the thing about the model is that, uh, it's very expensive, by the way. One license is $6,000, and I bought that. So uh, I have that now. So if anyone wants to use that, please tell me, because I got it. Um, but it, 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 the reason it's expensive is it embodies multipliers specific to Pitt County and Eastern North Carolina and North Carolina. So there are these licenses available for 
every region of the country, basically. And what it does is it, as I say, mimics the economy statistically, econometrically. So it, 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 it provides a, a sense of how growth in one industry can affect growth in another. So for instance, uh, when people come you know, to a basketball game here, <coughs> men's or women's, or who, what, what is the spending associated with that? What kind of economic impact would that be? You can use that kind of model to do this. Again, that stimulus, that external um, uh, impetus. The model uses multi-regional input-output analysis to generate impacts for Pitt County and the remainder of Eastern North Carolina. There is no license specific to the economics of Greenville, North Carolina, but Greenville, of course, is almost precisely one half of Pitt County's population. Last I checked, Greenville is home to about 91,000 people, Pitt County home to about 180,000 people. And so the, the multipliers in Greenville would look very much like the multipliers economically in Pitt County. We also calculated um, uh, economic impacts for the balance of Eastern North Carolina. So this is Eastern North Carolina defined. So in this analysis, Eastern North Carolina is defined as encompassing the following counties. Note that Pitt County is not included in the, any impacts pertaining to the balance of Eastern North Carolina. So we take out Pitt County, we model the balance of Eastern uh, North Carolina, and you could sum the two, of course, to get the overall impact in Eastern North Carolina. Some economic impact terminology. So there will be things that will ha be happening directly at Intersect East. These are the direct effects, right? The construction taking place at Intersect East, the shopping taking place at Intersect East, the research taking place at Intersect East, all of that, those are considered direct effects. There are also supply chain effects. So let's say you've got a, a biotechnology company at Intersect East ultimately, and they are purchasing various types of equipment uh, from suppliers in the area. Um, whatever it could be, it could be microscopes, could be whatever it is. Those are indirect effects. Those are business to business effects that are part of a broader supply chain. And so all of a sudden that company that distributes microscopes in the area, now they have more money and they will be able to spend more money uh, in, on behalf of uh, payroll or whatever expenses that they might have. Again, supply chain effects and then induced effects. So for instance, there will be some residences at Intersect East, that's part of the plan. Those folks are gonna spend money in the economy those are considered induced or household spending effects. And also the jobs created at Intersect East and around Intersect East will also support higher household uh, uh, incomes and that additional expenditure, that augmented expenditure also shows up in that induced effects category. So direct effects and secondary effects, those secondary effects are known as indirect and induced. Let's talk about some of the model inputs here. So broadly speaking, we divided the model or the, the project I should say into two pieces. So, Lotus, I use purple, by the way. That was on purpose, um, as it turns out. I'm, I'm clearly pandering to the audience here. But, but the point is, um, phase one, uh, if you look at it carefully, if you look at the f uh, fifth numeric column, you'll see the total square footage there. It's actually broken down between retail, industrial, residential, office, and research. But it's around 207,000 square feet, if you see that number in the fifth numeric column. That's phase one. Then you've got a bunch of later phases. And that's actually where the bulk of the investment, the bulk of the construction transpires. You've got about 775,000 square feet in those later phases. And so the overall project is close to a million square feet, 982,000 square feet and change. So just keep that in mind as I go through this. And we have written a report, by the way, that summarizes all of this. You can you know, pour over that. All of these tables are in that report. It can be awkward to present so much data on a PowerPoint slide. But in fact, the next slide is even worse. Let me look at this. This is a monstrosity. But this is uh, the phase one impacts of construction, economic impacts. So the first block there is Pitt County. The second block there, moving from north to south on the slide, is the balance of eastern North Carolina. And then you've got total eastern North Carolina. Uh, uh, and so I'll just focus on the Pitt County numbers at the top of the slide. So again, this is phase one construction, just construction. I'm not talking about occupancy or just the construction activity. Uh, and you can see that ultimately what this does, if you look at uh, direct effects, induced effects, and, uh, uh, indirect effects, induced effects, and then total, 515 jobs supported during construction in this county. Now, let me be clear about this, how this is measured. This is measured in job years. So for instance, if construction takes three years, let's say, as an example, it may not, but it, let's say it does. If one person is working the job for those three years, that's counted as three jobs. 
That's counted as three job, job years, okay? So that's the way that's counted. That translates into worker compensation once you take multiplier effects into account of about uh, $28.9, $30 million. And then economic <coughs> output, meaning business sales in the community augmented by around $62 million. So, okay, just keep that 515, memorize that number, please. 515 jobs, you got it? Got it, okay. Now this is economic impacts of phase two construction. Now, if you look at the jobs column there, again, in that first part, the first third of the slide there, that's Pitt County, as I say, that's 2,609 total jobs supported during construction. Again, the construction jobs and the multiplier effect. So we've got 515 plus 2609. Let's add up those two numbers, and you should get, I think, 3124. And so when I do the overall construction picture, what you get, oh, look at that, 3124. So the first key to having credibility in front of an audience is for the numbers to add up. And the numbers add up here. So that's 3,124 construction jobs supported during the entirety of construction. Let's, take, let's say that takes place uh, a, 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 for a decade. Uh, the market obviously determines these things, or helps to deter, determine these things. Worker compensation associated with those jobs in this county around $176 million in compensation, and then economic uh, output bolstered by around $366 million once you take into account the multiplier effects. Okay, so that's construction. And again, you can pour over these data, but it's very good for the local construction industry. My guess is that subcontractors and general contractors are very excited by this project. Obviously, one of the challenges they will have, and this is true for contractors around the country, is finding enough workers to do the job. But somehow, we still get things built in this country despite not having enough roofers and glaziers and carpenters and electricians and um, you know, mechanical contractors who work on HVAC, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, that kind of thing. Nonetheless, things get done in this country. Um, now, let's talk about the more important economic impacts, which relate to occupancy. The project is now occupied. Uh, professors are starting new companies, for instance. One of them might turn into a Biogen or a Biosys or an Oculus or whatever it happens to be. And then we're off to the races, of course. But even absent that, these are the economic impacts. And again, these economic impacts basically infuse this development into the economy as it is. But this economy could be very different by the, by the end of construction at some point, perhaps in the, in the 2030s. So if you look again at the first third, here it's Pitt County. So after phase one operational impacts. Now again, this is a minority of the project. The bulk of the construction takes place or investment takes place during subsequent phases. But we're talking about after phase one, 588 jobs support in this community that currently do not exist. We're talking about that associated with, with compensation around $35.4 million a year, measured in 2022 dollars, and total economic output impacts of $413 million per annum. It's a big effect, phase one, just phase one. But then let's look at the overall project at full build out. Uh, this is full build out. Now the effects are really, really large, newsworthy. There are some cameras here, media here. They sh you should write this down uh, if you're media, because this is important. Uh, jobs, 3,239. That's a lot of jobs of very high average quality. Yes, some of these jobs are in retail and, and so on and so forth, that's right, and they may not pay quite as much, though there's dignity in any job well performed. But a lot of these jobs are gonna be really high wage. They're gonna be business owners, they're gonna be researchers. Um, uh, you know, I would expect to see a lot of innovation in engineering and medical clusters for obvious reasons. It's the nature of uh, uh, East Carolina University. So uh, the worker compensation, as I say, associated with you know, nearly $200 million a year in compensation and then economic output bolstered by more than $600 million per annum. Now again, $600 million is a big number. It's a big number. But one company, some of these big companies can generate more than that in revenues by themselves. But again, I can't speculate on that. I don't know that that's gonna happen. You know, that an Infosys or something like that, which has to be an Indian company as it turns out, would be formed here. Um, I don't know that, but it is possible. And I would think that with uh, a university, the scale of East Carolina University, and with what is done there, dental school, medical school, engineering school, the chances are quite high. But again, that's not built into the implant model, and so it's not reflected here. Now, where there are economic impacts, there are fiscal ones. So wherever you have economic 
uh, impacts, you have tax revenue impacts. I, I think the, the notion is that, you know, sort of the, the three things that are for sure in life, death, taxes, and Beyonce. And so, um, uh, so let's talk about the fiscal impacts, shall we? So, um, so economic impacts beget fiscal ones. Uh, the fiscal impact estimates, the tax dollars generated by the construction operational phases of Intersect East were generated using estimates within the implant model, but also effective tax rates computed using data from state and local governments as well as the U.S. Census Bureau. The expected valuation of Intersect East built environments, which relates to property tax collections for instance, and then Census Bureau inflow outflow data to estimate where workers employed at Intersect East will live, because where they live, they might work here, in Greenville, but they might live someplace else. That affects, of course, where they spend their money and even, in some cases, how they spend their money. And so here are the fiscal impacts. There's just too much to go through here. I get that. But um, the top level there, the first part, is the city of Greenville. Here we can separate out city of Greenville from a fiscal uh, impact estimate perspective. And at full build out for the city of Greenville, we're talking about $2 million a year, roughly. Um, for Pitt County, it's $4.1 million. For the remainder uh, of uh, Eastern North Carolina, it's around half a million dollars a year. And then for the state of North Carolina, it is in the range of $7 million a year in augmented revenue. So the state of North Carolina is one of the big winners here. And they're a stakeholder here. And so there should be a rationale for the state of North Carolina to chip in significant resources to make this happen. And those asks are being made, but there's a, there, there's a valid reason the state of North Carolina selfishly should be investing in Greenville, uh, even apart from uh, the fact that it ought to, on moral or ethical grounds, be investing in Greenville, um, that there is actually a selfish reason to put money into this project. So this provides you with some of the estimates, the trajectory of these um, fiscal impacts over time. So that blue b uh, line there at the top is North Carolina, the yellow line there is Pitt County, and the purple line appropriately at the bottom is the city of Greenville. So, you know, those are the fiscal, and again, this is all summarized in a report, and you can see our methods uh, uh, at greater detail. And I would say this, too, that Greenville could use a bit of a spark economically. So this is, bless you, this is um, non-farm employment growth since January of 2011 indexed. So you could just compare different geographies. So that red line there is Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, that metropolitan school area. No surprise, very rapidly growing. By the way, North Carolina is a juggernaut in terms of economic development in this country. Um, in Site Selection Magazine ranks North Carolina first in the country. Uh, this is the most appealing place for businesses to locate to and expand in, in the country. Um, it'll be very interesting to see the battle between the state that's often ranked second in the country, which is Virginia. Uh, Virginia's new governor, Glenn Youngkins, who is very pro-economic development. Uh, so basically, it'll be Duke versus North Carolina in the world of economic development, except it's North Carolina versus Virginia. But you get my point. Um, uh, and so uh, it, it should be really very interesting. But all of a sudden, Greenville has an opportunity to play in that sandbox in a way it has not before, to be part of that broader North Carolina story, which is really quite a brilliant one. The second uh, line here is Charlotte MSA. The, uh, the yellow line is overall North Carolina. So again, all that financial services growth, uh, True is putting its headquarters in Charlotte and all those kinds of things that we've seen. And the bottom line there in purple again appropriately is Greenville, where growth has been softer. Not zero, you can see uh, that's not the case. Uh, and you can see the loss of jobs during the pandemic, but slower. This would catalyze this region. Some will characterize this, by the way, as a jolt to the economy. It's more than that. A jolt connotes a short-term push forward. This is something much more permanent. This is about technology, uh, the evolution of knowledge, uh, and that, that can have much more permanent effects. And so in summation, some of the analytical highlights, Intersect East will generate an estimated $12.2 million in tax revenues for the city of Greenville by 2032. Pitt County tax revenues will be augmented by an estimated $23 million over that span. The 3,000 plus jobs supported at full build out will have a transformative effect on a region of the state that has lagged economically at least the major metropolitan areas. Intersect East will support more than $200 million in worker compensation each year upon full build out, greatly enhancing regional spending power. And then research parks are a critical mechanism for, a mechanism for university towns to leverage their existing assets and can generate industry clusters, further bolstering economic activity and its economic activity I can scarcely imagine, and as I say, is not built into the bottom. 
So that's uh, my presentation. I hope that was not too much, but uh, that's, that, that's my report and I'm sticking to it. Thanks you very much for the opportunity. It's been a privilege. Yeah, are there any questions uh, about anything economic here? Any, any questions? Whatsoever? If they're not, that's, that's perfectly fine. I have a Dodge waiting out for me out there to take me to the airport. Oh, yes, sir, in the back. Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, sure. I mean, there, there are many, many towns that I could have compared Greenville to. The issue is that I would have separately had to buy their licenses, uh, and right. So, but uh, you know, certainly there are in my my state of Maryland, Southern Maryland, lots of tobacco. You know, lots of you know, Calvert County, Maryland, so on and so forth. So you see, uh, you know, a number of cities there like Dunkirk, so on and so forth, that are similar, not in size, not necessarily they're smaller, but similar in terms of their previous economic makeup. And, um, and so, you know, sa same kind of trajectory um, in terms of economic impact. There are towns in South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina has some similarly situated history, right? Textile town, textiles go away, how do you re reinvent yourself? Obviously it's a much larger town now, home to BMW and Michelin and so on and so forth. So it's, it, I could find towns for you, but did I do those comparisons to similarly situated towns? I did not. Any other questions here? That was a very fine one. Any other questions here? Nothing? You don't want to talk about Bitcoin? You want to talk about Bitcoin? You do want to talk about Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, we can talk about $4 gallon gasoline, all kinds of things, 7.5% inflation. Um, Dow Jones is rallying this morning, madam, so that should make you feel good. Good, good. You're in a good mood now. Uh, any, other, any other questions here? Yes, madam in the back. Right, right. Thank you for that's a great question, madam. I, I don't think it affects them that much because this is a presumably a short term impact on the economy. Yes, I understand that oil prices have surged, though they came down overnight, by the way. They came down to $117 a barrel, you might have noticed. Um, and so uh, uh, the, the, the presumption is that, yes, there is this conflict in Russia and Ukraine, and yes, there's some effect on the energy markets, that much is clear, but it, it's a limited effect. I mean, how many of us wear Russian shoes? How many of us drove a Russian car here? Right? How many of us would fly on an airplane built by the Russians? So many segments go untouched. Oil prices were actually already quite high coming into this period, and this exacerbates the situation, don't get me wrong, but already markets are starting to handle this. Oil prices were up at $130 a barrel overnight recently, a particular night, now down to 117 I'm not saying that's going to continue. There's going to be volatility. Natural gas prices are high. Steel, aluminum, copper, platinum, palladium, nickel, you know, neon. All things that are produced in abundance in Ukraine and, and or Russia. Wheat. But again, um, I don't think this, this is, you know, we're talking about effects till 2032. And it's quite conceivable. Who knows what Vladimir Putin has up his sleeves? I mean, who knows? He's a madman. I mean, I'm wearing blue and yellow for a reason today. You know, but um, it, it may very well be the case that by April, the situation on the ground is very different. And the economy is normalizing and, you know, interest rates are relatively unaffected, those kinds of things. And a development like this can move forward apace. Any other questions here? Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, that's a great, great question because that's what it comes down to. In fact, we talk about live, work, play, but many people live where they work and vice versa these days, as you know. So, and in a, an environment in which people can work almost anywhere if they're, let's say, a remote worker, where are they going to choose to work? They're going to choose to work in places that, are, that offer the highest quality of life. And what does that mean, highest quality of life? 
recreational opportunities. Having universities so you can see an East Carolina play Cincinnati, which is what they're doing tomorrow. And, you know, whatever it happens to be, not necessarily here, but the point is they're playing them. And so, yes, it's, it's about that. It's about, um, it's about having people live here who can live anywhere. They can live in Raleigh-Durham. That's one of the reasons that Raleigh-Durham is so successful, by the way. It's a very high quality of life. So if you're a, a graduate student and you're graduating, you're thinking, where should I live? Should I live in you know, San Jose to be part of Silicon Valley? Should I live in Boston? Or should I live in Raleigh-Durham or Atlanta or wherever it happens to be, Nashville, Tennessee? Raleigh-Durham often wins that because it's got lower cost of living than San Francisco. It's got, or San Jose, it's got uh, better temperatures or better, much better weather than Boston, so on and so forth, right? Uh, and then Atlanta, of course, you've got to watch the Falcons. That's no good. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, um, so th this, this all of a sudden creates uh, a Greenville, I think. That's already a spectacular community. Please do not get me wrong. I'm not casting any aspersions here. But it's always a work in progress. And I think what we're talking about here is progress along the dimension of quality of life, which is what keeps people here, but also will bring more people here who do really interesting things. Any other questions from this audience? Yes, sir. Uh, with the added 3,500 jobs mentioned full time with this project, are there any other uh, industries or infrastructure that would help make sure that the, the city stays growing, that there are new the city needs to help sustain that growth? All right, so the question is about sustaining growth and you know, to, you know, the momentum created by Intersect East, but how do you sustain that? But, you know, Tim mentioned. You know, there are other developers right now. There's other investment, other infusions of capital taking place in this community. Greenville has gotten on the map with respect to those who have significant amounts of capital and are looking to deploy that capital here. So again, it's always a work in progress. And I will say this, and Tim might not want me to say this, but I'll say this. At the end of the day, this translates into about 10 square feet of space per capita. Ten, and that, that's not insignificant, it's almost a million square feet, but it's a community of 91,000 people. So 10, you know, 10, 11 square feet of space per capita. Is that itself going to guarantee broadly shared prosperity into economic perpetuity? Of course not, but it's a right start. And it's a way to channel the energies at East Carolina University into this community. It's the start, but it's not the end. It's a, you know, the, the, the ocean is constantly moving in and moving out. It's ebbing and flowing, as Tim pointed out uh, correctly. And so you, you, know, keep, you, know, you don't want it to ebb away from you. And this is a way to bring the ocean to us, but then you've got to keep you know, those magnetic efforts uh, in place. So yeah, infrastructure, obviously the quality of education, public school education, because one of the things that emerging young families want, they want great public schools. So lots of things have to happen to make this work. Any other, yes, sir. Right, so the question becomes, how do we market the great things that are happening at um, Intersect East and in Greenville generally to the external community? Well, I'm not probably the best person to, to talk about that. I'm an economist, right? I mean, uh, we do a pretty bad job marketing, right? I mean, how many people have friends who are economists, right? Nobody. No one has a friend who's an economist. So um, uh, we rarely go on dates, you know? I mean, we're just not good at marketing, you know, along any dimension. But, you know, obviously, I think that significant investment captures attention. And you've already got a, a fairly significant number of investors who are looking at this community. So already somehow the word's gotten out. And to have East Carolina University here, it's here. It's a big deal. To have one of the largest hospitals in the world here, or country here, that's a big deal. It's amazing that more people don't know that's the case. So I would agree with your, the premise of your question, which is, this community probably could use some better marketing because a lot of the assets that are here are not well known to people. Uh, and again, that marketing would benefit the hospital, the, the university, so on and so forth. It would benefit the developers of Sidewalk East, I mean, of, of, uh, uh, yeah, of Intersect East and, and, and other, other developments. And what can I say? Best answer, social media, right? I mean, I think it's Instagram these days. So that would be my best answer. Any other questions here? We'll wrap it up there. Okay. Let's Best economist around. I've had the great pleasure of being a friend of an economist, one of the few in the room. Uh, listen, uh, 
we're here, we're thankful for this. We talked about human capital. In this room is incredible human capital here, right in this very room. We appreciate it, Brian and I, clearly ECU appreciates it. The city appreciates it, but here's the deal. You know, we have incredible things in Greenville right now as far as industry. We have boat companies here, right? Grady White, are they going away? Probably not. We have a company, Heister Yale, who's here. Uh, they are part of what I'm calling the Amazon economy, you know. They are 100 trucks short a day of their seven plants around the world and getting shipment moving. So look at the opportunity there of companies. We have in this room today some of the on-deck incredible, incredible economy changes. We have uh, Mr. Beast in town. That's the craziest thing ever. Wow, that's a new economy. Um, the young millennial loves that kind of thing. I'm on it. 44 million viewers. Wow. Uh, we almost have 43 million online. It's incredible. Uh, not true. <laughs> so uh, the issue here is there's on-deck companies that we need to get ready for. There's some in this room here. Apogee is here. They are in the new economy. They're going to grow like a weed. Many companies like them. Grover Gaming. I mean, incredible. Health tech is going to arrive like a freight train. We're here. Brian and I are trying to set the designs for a boat. We have the city helping us to build the boat. We have ECU helping us to pilot the boat, and I'd love every one of you in here to row with us, and we will make Greenville definitely a greater place because of all of you and this project moving forward. We thank you so much. We have tours of this great building invested here, so that's afterward. Again, we thank so much, and we look forward to growing this city with you. Appreciate it. Thank you.